Okay, while people are drifting in, I'm going to go ahead and begin. Uh, thank you all for uh, joining us here for this session on FirstNet and Next Generation 911 update. Uh, my name is Barry Frazier. I am the general manager of the Bay Ricks Authority uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area. And I am uh, also um, the chair of the uh, NATOA Public Safety Technology Committee and also NATOA's representative on the FirstNet Public Safety Advisory Committee. And um, before I do anything else, I just want to do a quick commercial announcement for the Public Safety Committee. Uh, if any of you are interested in the issues that we're talking about today, and there are very many issues that are happening that are of real importance to cities and counties, uh, I would encourage you and invite you to join the Public Safety Committee. You can sign up uh, here or send myself or Tanya an email, and we can get you on the committee. Um, we're, we're discussing these, these issues on a monthly basis on conference calls, and if you really want to keep up with things, uh, please uh, consider joining, joining that committee. Uh, a couple of housekeeping, um, these, these are standard things, you've heard them before. Cell phones off or on vibrate, so they're not going off in the middle of the session. Uh, hold your questions until the end. Uh, we'll, we'll allow plenty of time at the end of the, end of the session for, for Q&A. Uh, so again, thank you for joining us. I just wanted to um, say first, I see a lot of familiar faces in the audience. Uh, I, it's good to see everyone. Uh, I missed last year, but it's good to be back. Uh, and, I, you know, I wanted to, to, to just kind of start off by talking about how NATOA has uh, gone from a traditional cable franchising association and organization. Uh, and over the past few years, though, we've really uh, focused a, a lot of our, of, our, of our resources and efforts on broadband. Uh, broadband has become um, basically uh, an essential um, an essential element of our lives through cable modem service, high-speed internet, uh, wireless smartphones and tablets. Uh, and we're all kind of familiar with digital divide issues by now, the information haves and have-nots. We're going to talk here today a little bit about a different type of digital divide issue. Um, our police, our firefighters, our paramedics, uh, our emergency uh, first responders um, really don't have access to a lot of the broadband tools that we take for granted on a daily basis today. Uh, our police and firefighters are still using mostly um, voice communications. Uh, they don't have a lot of access to digital tools, to broadband. Uh, and on, on the 911 side, uh, most every 911 call center is limited to voice calls. Uh, the ability to send text or send photos or, or email to, uh, to uh, make a 911 request uh, really isn't, isn't available in most places. But those things are going to change, and we're going to talk today about some of the changes that are happening. Um, and I want to uh, introduce our uh, distinguished panel in just a minute, but first I wanted to make uh, an introduction to someone in the audience today. Uh, Sheriff of Hennepin County, Richard Stanick. Uh, sheriff Stanick, it's great to have you here today. Uh, in addition to being a, a longtime sheriff of the county, that is uh, the county that Minneapolis uh, is in, I believe, uh, Sheriff Stanick has recently been appointed to the FirstNet board uh, and will be representing uh, uh, sheriffs and uh, first responders uh, on, on the FirstNet board. And we're very honored to have uh, Sheriff in the audience today. Uh, and uh, Maybe he'll ask us a question or two. <laughs> so uh, moving on, I want to introduce our panel and talk a little bit about what they're going to speak about, and then I'll get out of the way and let them talk. Um, first, we have Amanda Hilliard, who is Outreach Director, director for FirstNet. She is the first and only Outreach Director for FirstNet. She served since the beginning of this year. Uh, before uh, coming over to FirstNet, she, was, she worked for the Department of Homeland Security Office of Emergency Communication for several years. She was heavily involved in some of the SAFECOM activities. NATOA also has a representative, representative, representative on the DHS SAFECOM committee. Uh, and before that, she did consulting work, and, uh, in, uh, including working with the, uh, the Boston Metro Homeland Security Region. Um, She's going to talk about FirstNet, where it stands, 
where it's going and what, uh, why it's important for cities and counties to be paying attention to FirstNet. Uh, next we have Gigi Smith, who is the um, immediate past president of APCO, the, I hope I get this right, Alliance for Public Safety Communications Officials uh, International. Uh, APCO is very heavily involved and has been for years in, in all types of important public safety communications initiatives. Uh, they they uh, do a lot of good work. Um, Gigi was the president uh, in 1913 and, and now is the immediate past president. She's from uh, Salt Lake City, Utah. She is currently the, um, the police operations manager for the Salt Lake Valley Communi Communications Center uh, in West Valley City, Utah. She has basically dedicated her entire life to public safety and first response. Uh, since the uh, age of 18, she first stepped into a dispatch center and uh, she has uh, spent her whole life working in public safety communications. Uh, and she's also been heavily involved with APCO, uh, rising to the level of president last year. Um, we appreciate having Gigi here today. Uh, the third person on our panel is Mark Dumanski. Um, he is the deputy commission of the Minnesota Department of Public Safety. Um, before uh, that position, he served as assistant commissioner uh, and before that, he was the chief of the Minnesota, Minnesota State Patrol. Uh, and he had worked for the Minnesota State Patrol for many years prior to becoming to working for the Department of Public Safety. Uh, he's also heavily, been heavily involved in the International Association of, of uh, uh, Police Chiefs. Um, and um, Mr. Donansky will talk about um, uh, uh, what this means uh, to state and local governments and what's going on in Minnesota uh, as, as we move forward with FirstNet and with upgrading our 911 centers. So I am going to stop talking now and I'm going to uh, ask Amanda to come up and uh, we'll begin our, our panelists. Thank you. Well, thanks, Barry, for the introduction, and thank you all for being here with us today to, to learn more about FirstNet and uh, Next Generation 911. I'm going to start by showing you just a, a quick video clip um, that will give you a sense, if, if you're not familiar with FirstNet, for, um, about what FirstNet is, why it's so important um, for public safety communications, and to touch briefly on the synergies we see between FirstNet and Next Generation 911. When disaster strikes, all units in the main triage group need to move west, away out of the line of fire. When duty calls, Oklahoma City 911. We just went through a tornado at Choctaw Road and the love. It's gone. America's first responders need dedicated, secure, priority communications. We just went through the middle of it. We're on Choctaw Road. The floods down here is just completely obliterated. There are people hurt all over the place. When multiple agencies respond together to save lives, they need the ability to talk to each other. Being connected from dispatch to the incident commander to the responders in the field is imperative to the successful resolution of an incident. FirstNet will empower first responders with state-of-the-art communication tools. A nationwide broadband network will connect police officers, firefighters, and EMS providers like never before. You know information is power, and FirstNet will put that power into the hands of those who need it most. Public safety is evolving. With new technology comes new opportunity to innovate and save lives. Next Generation 911 will revolutionize how the public requests assistance and reports incidents, allowing people to send videos, photos, and other high-speed data to call takers and public safety answering points throughout the country. The nationwide public safety broadband network will be a force multiplier for responding to emergencies, enabling information sent using NG911 capabilities to reach first responders in the field. This will help firefighters, law enforcement officials, and EMTs with awareness and decision making even before they arrive at the scene. America's first responders need the very best tools we can put in their hands, 
an interoperable broadband network will deliver innovation and seamless communications to public safety with true priority. Find out more at www.firstnet.gov. So again, just wanted to, to use that video to do a quick introduction. Um, what I'm going to do here uh, during the next 15 minutes or so is take a step back, talk a little bit about the history of FirstNet, how we came to be, um, talk a little bit more about what we plan to offer uh, to the public safety community, and then how we plan to, to work with you all in the public safety community to make this network a reality. So this year marks a decade since the 9-11 Commission stated as one of its findings that public safety should be given additional spectrum to keep up with the growing voice and data communications needs. Um, in truth, that recommendation was the last to be fulfilled. As you all probably know, spectrum is a scarce and, and very valuable resource. But in 2011, 10 years after the 9-11 attacks that exposed uh, many of the public safety communications gaps, every major public safety organization and um, intergovernmental, intergovernmental associations came together um, to ask uh, as their top legislative priority um, for the D block to be reallocated to, to public safety. So this uh, was a very monumental effort, not only because it was coordinated um, on the need for spectrum, but the, the group also asked that the spectrum would be used for one national network. Um, as you may or may not know, today we estimate there's approximately 10 to 20,000 disparate land mobile radio networks. So um, having one network from the beginning will really help with this interoperability issue. So then in the spring of um, 2012, this vision became closer to reality with the passage of the Middle Class Tax Relief and Job Creation Act which created the First Responder Network Authority, or FirstNet, um, to ensure the build, deployment, and operation of the nationwide public safety broadband network. So let me take a few minutes to touch on um, some of the key aspects that are laid out in the legislation. First, it establishes FirstNet as an independent authority within the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, which is housed in the U.S. Department of Commerce. Um, it set up a, a board of 15 members, which is established by the Department of Commerce's secretary. And the board is required to have at least three representatives uh, who represent public, or um, who served as a public safety professional. We currently have four, with uh, Sheriff Stanek being one of those. Um, and we're also required to have three representatives to represent the collective interests of states, localities, territories, and, and tribes. Um, with some of the most recent appointments, we now have a, a mayor on the board as well as a former governor. Um, on the bottom left here, the, the law also required the establishment of a public safety advisory committee, which was one of the first um, actions that the board took upon being established. As Barry mentioned, um, he represents NATOA on the PSAC, um, and there are 40 members. Most of the organizations that you saw on that previous slide have a, have a seat on this committee. Um, that we've been meeting with regularly and has, has been great to give a lot of input to our organization. Um, as I mentioned, the, the act reallocates the D-block spectrum to public safety. FirstNet is the, um, holds the license for that spectrum. And as you see on the top right, $7 billion have been, has been allocated uh, for this effort. Um, and the, the law requires us to be self-sustaining um, with the ability to collect fees. And then lastly, um, another highlight is that the, the act um, requires deployment, stages, deployment stages with substantial rural coverage milestones. Which leads into my next slide here. So our obligation at, at FirstNet is to provide the best possible communications network dedicated to first responders everywhere. So we have to ensure um, seamless coverage in all 56 states and territories, from tribal lands and rural areas where there's uh, today may be limited or, or no coverage to the sprawling urban areas that currently today have uh, saturation of their commercial networks. We have to create a lot reliable product across all these different geographies and demographics. Um, we know that will be challenging and we um, plan to work closely with the public safety community as well as the private sector again to make this a reality. We're looking at a lot of different options um, in addition to a terrestrial network to again uh, meet the to um, meet the different geography of this country. Um, we're looking at deployable assets, satellite technologies, things like mobile repeaters. Um, we've, we've done some requests for information, some market analysis to, to explore different options. 
So let me just take a, a few minutes to talk about the, the promise of FirstNet, what we plan to deliver. Um, we will bring to the public safety community a dedicated and interoperable network with quality of service, priority usage, and preemption. So I um, wanted to take a minute just to talk about what we see differentiating us from today's commercial wireless networks that uh, many in the public safety community are using. Today when there's a, a large incident, let's say an earthquake, um, the general public is, is getting on their smartphones. People are sending texts. They're making phone calls to family members, to friends. People are getting on the internet to, to find the latest news of, of what's going on. Um, the networks quickly become congested and, and data rates slow or at some point people can't even get on the network. Public safety is competing with the general public um, to use these networks. So with the FirstNet network, one, it'll be a dedicated network to public safety. We hope on the average day um, this 20 megahertz of spectrum will be sufficient and for public safety to use. But on those really bad days where the network may become congested, we're going to have priority and preemption to ensure that those responders and, and those folks uh, helping the public safety responders have um, uninterrupted access to the, the critical data that they need. The network will also be hardened as needed from a physical perspective and will be resilient, secure, and high, highly reliable. So again, we, provide, we plan to provide more redundancies, uh, more, a more secure network than what uh, commercial networks offer today. Um, we also plan to facilitate the use of rugged or um, easy to use devices designed to meet public safety needs and provide a rich set of applications. There's been great um, interest in the, with APCO and, and with the private sector in developing specific applications for public safety. And then lastly, as you uh, heard on the video, um, FirstNet will enable the data that the public will eventually be able to provide through this next generation 911 effort um, with the public providing dispatch centers with video, text, um, through the FirstNet network, we'll be able to get that into the hands of the first responders that are actually going to respond to that incident. So let me talk a minute um, about the current state of communications and, and where we see things evolving. So currently, uh, the public safety community might be using um, commercial wireless data for non-mission critical data. They're using um, smartphones, they're using mobile data terminals in their vehicles. Um, in terms of voice, everyone is using and relying on their land mobile radio networks. In the near term, the vision for FirstNet is to make mobile data a capability that public safety can rely on. So we're looking to provide mission critical data when we first roll out the FirstNet network. Um, we still expect that public safety will rely on their land mobile radio for that mission critical voice communications. And then lastly, um, in terms of the longer term vision, um, we hope that when the technology, when the standards are in place, and when public safety trusts it and says that they'll allow it, um, that mission critical voice will be available on the FirstNet network and on our devices. So again, the, the key message I want to make here, at least for the, the near term and as we initially roll out the FirstNet network, um, public safety agencies should continue to invest in their land mobile radio for that mission critical voice communications. This next slide here is a little bit of a, an eyeful. I'll, I'll let you read that later when the slides are made available online. But I wanted to use this to just trans transition into some of the key activities that our um, organization is working on right now, again, to, to get to that reality of a network. Um, we are working to initiate a public notice and comment process um, to get clear on some of the areas in our legislation where there's a little bit of amb ambiguity. Um, we are working on a, our acquisition approach and working to put out a draft request for proposal for a comprehensive network solution um, early next year. And last, we are, are beginning formal state consultations, which I'm going to talk about next. So through the Act, uh, FirstNet is required to consult with all 56 states and territories through a governor-designated state single point of contact, or a SPOC, as we refer to them. This slide here shows a, a number of topics that we're required to consult with each of the states and territories on. So construction of the network, placement of towers, coverage, um, assignment of users, priority of users, uh, hardening, security, reliability, and resiliency, as well as training. We've outlined a, a detailed process that we released in, in March of this year. It's in the top right here. I'm not going to get into detail about it, but we've mapped out a really detailed process 
of how we think uh, we'll work with the 56 states and territories to consult on those topics. And at the end um, of this process, one of the primary goals of our consultation process is to deliver a state plan to each governor uh, where he or she will make a decision to either opt in or opt out of the plan. Um, at a really high level, if a state chooses to opt in and to the, the plan that we deliver, FirstNet would be responsible for the costs related to building, maintaining, and operating the network. Um, the users within the state, of course, would pay fees to FirstNet for services. If a state chooses to opt out, um, they would, the state would be responsible for the costs related to the build, operation, and maintenance of the radio access network portion, which would interoperate with the FirstNet core. So again, um, through this consultation process, we'll be working very closely. There'll be multiple meetings. We're just starting this process now. There'll be multiple iterations of the plan um, where our team from FirstNet will be working very closely um, with the states, with the public safety community um, to hopefully hand in hand develop a plan that at the end of the day, we hope all the governors are eager to sign. Uh, this map here shows where we are right now with our initial consultation process. So, like I said, I didn't go into detail on the map, but we're, we're over to the left. We're just the beginning stages of this consultation activity. Um, in April, we released a checklist to each of the 56 states and territories and asked for some information to be provided to FirstNet um, around governance, around outreach activities related to broadband and FirstNet, around current uh, usage of commercial commercial wireless services, um, we essentially ask states to provide back to us some of their information and indicate that they're ready to meet with FirstNet. And we wanted to collect some information in advance so that when we come and, and have our first consultation meeting with the state that we're well informed, you know, we, we've kind of studied, we have all the background. So to date, 27 of the 56 states and territories have, have submitted packages and indicated they're ready to meet with FirstNet. We've had our first two consultation meetings uh, in Maryland back in July and Minnesota last week, which Mark is gonna talk about. So we're just getting the, the process started, but some of the key topics we're discussing here in the early stages is one, just an opportunity to do some more outreach for participants to hear directly from FirstNet about the latest updates. Um, we're also looking to talk about coverage and users, as well as um, talk about some specific use cases for mobile broadband. So again, if, as you're looking at this map, if you see your state is one of the states that has not yet submitted a package, that's okay. Um, again, we're in the early processes. We know somebody will have to be last. Um, for the states that go a little bit later, later in this early process, there'll be more information. Our acquisition process will become clear. So we've had really good relationships with all 56 states and territories. We have monthly calls with the SPOC. So please know that, that all the states are engaged. Some have just been a little further ahead than others. So the last thing I wanted to talk about is um, a request for proposal and a public comment notice that we recently put out. I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, but I just wanted to make you aware of both of these documents where we're looking to get some feedback from the public. So our latest request for information, which we put out a few weeks ago, comments are due at the um, October 17th. Um, essentially, this document provides a little more information on our acquisition approach and, and how we're looking to deploy the network. We're looking for input to better understand industries, capabilities, um, evaluate potential procurement processes, and determine um, existing capabilities and best practices to meet public safety needs. The RFI also includes 15 draft statement of objectives that will inform our, our draft RFP. We're looking for feedback on that in addition to um, some approaches from industry of, of how they might meet those objectives. Again, responses are due October 17th. And then the other document is our, our public notice. And this is where, again, we're, we're looking to clear up some of the ambu ambiguities in the legislation, such as on users, definition of rural, um, definition of the core of the radio access network. Uh, if there's lawyers in the room, it's a, it's a very legal um, document, but again, we're, we're looking for feedback on our interpretations, and there's a few areas where we ask questions um, to seek guidance on how we should interpret things. Um, and responses to that are due October 24th. We've engaged closely with the SPOC community, with the Public Safety Advisory Committee, to go through these documents and have encouraged uh, folks to respond. So in closing, um, again, I wanted to thank you all for being here today, for your interest in this 
effort and I hope that you all will work with us to make this network a reality. Um, our website has a lot of great information, firstnet.gov. Um, all the spot contact information is out there as well as the listing of PSAC organizations and individuals. Um, we have a number of blogs and, and other resources out there. Uh, we also have an active social media presence, so you can go to our web website and that'll take you directly to our YouTube page, uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, if, if you're interested in keeping up to date. So thank you, and I, I think we'll have some time for questions at the end. Thank you, Amanda. And uh, we'll just move right on now to an update on uh, Next Generation 911, Gigi. Good afternoon. Well, again, thank you for having me. I am so thrilled to be here. And Next Generation 911 is such an exciting topic for me. I'm going to try to stick to my slides, but I do find myself diverted every now and then. Um, as Barry introduced myself, I have dedicated my life to public safety since I was just about this tall. Um, this next chapter in my life, I've now looking forward to dedicating myself, continuing with public safety, but also bettering communications within public safety. And that's where Next Generation 911 comes in. As I look at this Gigi Smith immediate past president, I chuckle because people say, well, what exactly does immediate past president mean? Well, quite honestly, it means has been. Um, but again, I do take it very seriously. Our annual conference was just a couple weeks ago, and I passed the baton to our now president, John Wright, a little bit about APCO. We are an international association with over 21,000 members, and so it's very important for us to ensure that our members have the best communication and the best tools for their job. Our members are typically telecommunicators, frontline dispatchers, call takers, radio technicians, IT professionals, and we also have law enforcement, firefighters, and emergency medical responders that are within our membership. I will attempt to. All right. So what is Next Generation 911? And normally when I speak, I will ask the audience, what do you think Next Generation 911 is? And if there are 75 people in the audience, I will typically get 75 answers. And all of you are correct. Next Generation 911 is everything. It's text to 911, it's pictures to 911, photos to 911. It's receiving medical stats from our emergency responders. It's receiving maps and being able to guide responders through a building if there's smoke or fire. So there's so much. So what I did is, for the purpose of this slide, is I narrowed it down into two bullet points. The first one being a network of networks, and the second one being a multimedia that will enable public safety to receive what our citizens currently do. Older analog communication technology is being replaced by modern digital systems. The same holds true for public safety answering points, also known as PSAPs. We're moving towards internet protocol, which is IP-based next generation 911 systems. And with this new network of networks, NG911 systems will make it possible for PSAPs and authorized agencies to be able to interoperate with, in, with, with each other. They'll be able to talk to each other, which currently we cannot do. You'll hear a term called ESINETs, which is the Emergency Services IP Networks, which is what the network specific are called that support the next generation 911 systems. The new NG911 PSAPs will also be able to accept the new and advanced forms of communication, those that our citizens currently have that we cannot, such as those maps, pictures, videos, text messages. And additionally, FirstNet will utilize a technology known as the IP Multimedia System, which is IMS. It's a new standardized way to deliver multimedia information among the members of public safety community. Therefore, we expect FirstNet to become integrated with PSAP's next generation 911 must be fully interoperable. In regards to APCO's perspective on FirstNet, APCO led the lobbying efforts but was joined by a host of other national, public safety, and other state and local governmental associations which made a huge impact on Capitol Hill as Amanda had mentioned. FirstNet has been charged with leveraging public-private partnerships with both industry and state local government in order to take advantage of the most advanced technologies available as well as the efficiencies and economies of scale that to date public safety has not been able to accomplish. 
Additionally, FirstNet will build a nationwide level of interoperability from the start, which is incredibly important to our emergency responders. That's been our goal from the start, is to allow them to talk with each other. A key requirement that APCO strongly supported was the need for FirstNet to consult with the state and local governments and agencies. We're pleased to see how FirstNet has fully embraced this big challenge. We are hearing good feedback thus far from our members across the various states. By using LTE, long-term evolution, a worldwide standard, public safety will be able to benefit from the advanced features and capabilities enjoyed by the consumers. APCO seeks to help FirstNet as much as possible. We do this by including them and participating in all of our forums, our meetings, and we allow for them to come and speak and teach our public safety members exactly what is necessary in this move. With the integration of NG911 and FirstNet, in order to ensure a smooth transition of data from the public to the PSAP via the NG911, also known as the request half of the equation, and from the PSAP to the first responder via FirstNet, known as the response half of the networks, the compa compatibility among ESINETs need to be there, and it's critical. It's also important, as mentioned earlier in the technology, that FirstNet will be able to transmit multimedia information. In both NG911 and FirstNet, the amount of real-time multimedia information flowing in and out of the PSAP is going to be substantial. PSAPs will need to receive, process, prioritize, and transmit the data more efficiently in a fully cooperative and effective manner than ever before. This is a conceptual diagram to illustrate just that, NG911 and FirstNet to become integrated. NG911 will have the multiple communication inputs, the computers, cell phones, the VoIP, the connected vehicles, et cetera. The next generation 911 facilities will serve as the nerve center for the input for the public and analysis of the data and then sharing it with our responders. FirstNet will enable the multimedia data sharing from the PSAPs to the responders and among the responders and then back to the PSAP. In regards to the importance of public safety applications, and what I'd like to take away from this slide regarding the interplay between next generation 911 and FirstNet is the expanding role of mobile apps and what they're going to play within next generation 911. There will be multiple mobile app technologies that will be used by members and the general public to request emergency assistance personnel <coughs> in the NG911 centers and by FirstNet users. APCO created the website. It's up there, appcom.org. And if I may just divert for just a moment, because I'm very excited about this, please check it out. Currently, there is just under 200 applications that have been uploaded to this site. The purpose of this site is to go through and validate whether it is a good app or a bad app. There are many times where there's good intentions, but it always doesn't work the way it should work or how it was envisioned. Um, within this site, you can also go in and you can set a profile. If you're interested in seeing all the apps that are on the system, you can keep it open. Or if you're more interested in seeing just those that are regarding law enforcement, or those that are regarding firefighting or emergency medical services, you can create that profile, which will then give you a notification as to when a new application has been uploaded. The goal of this website is to go in and to actually hands-on use those applications and then report whether you felt that they were good or whether they were bad, whether they were utilized in the correct way and whether they would be something that the public, yourselves, would be interested in or whether or not there were some hiccups that we need to be aware of that we just didn't think about. What's interesting to me, this is where I'm going to divert just a little bit, is a, gosh, a year or so ago I had been invited to the White House and they were having what they called a data palooza or a data jam. And what they wanted to do is they wanted those from boots on the ground to technologists to those that are working in more of a cable area to come in and be able to put apps together. Well, it's one of those things, how many times have you been sitting around you know, the bar or at dinner and you said, wouldn't it be cool if we could do this? Or wouldn't it be great if there was this such a thing? That's exactly what this was. This was a think tank at the White House. 
And what they looked for is they said, we want you here in the audience to come up with apps for public safety. Now, knowing it was going to be hard to wrangle in that many ideas, they then put our focus towards officer safety. And they said, today, we want you to come up with an application that is going to ensure that officers get home safe after their shift. So that helped to narrow down our thinking. And then that's when we were able to start doing the what if and wouldn't it be great if this took place. And so after a day of putting things together, it was amazing to me because I know for myself sitting in a 911 <coughs> communication center on those long cold graveyard shifts, that's exactly what we did is we came up with crazy scenarios that you might only see in the movies. But sitting in this room at the White House, we were able to put those ideas out and then the incredible technologists that were there were able to respond to us almost immediately <coughs> and say, oh, I could do that. Oh, I probably have that done before I get on the metro. It was incredible. So what they did do is after everybody submitted their ideas, they had the room vote on what they thought were the top three. And with those, a few months later, the White House invited everybody back to see exactly what the status was on actually creating those top three applications. So they did that, and then at that point, that's when they were uploaded to APCO's website, APCOM.org. And this is where you can go in and you can test those. And like I say, it's just incredible to see what the future holds. As I was having a conversation with Mark, I was talking about uh, how I'd been to a conference recently where during the conference they had a front end of a police vehicle. And as I sat down on the seat, in between the two seats was what looked like an Xbox game player. And I said, well, this is an interesting thing. And what was explained to me by the vendor was that that's because the generation that is coming into law enforcement now, they grew up playing video games. They are very comfortable having some type of a player in their hand. So rather than having an officer have to look around the car and try to flip on the switches for the cameras and the sirens and what have you, he or she can just push a button they're very comfortable with in holding something in their hand to be able to turn on those type of systems. That was amazing to me. That's the forward thinking that Next Generation is all about. So I applaud them and I applaud what they're doing and what they're working on. Okay, so back to the slide. Um, as far as the applications, again, please go through and check those out. And as part of our efforts, we've engaged in a standards effort to address the needed training and revised operations that will follow the deployment of the next generation systems. We're also working on a standard for next generation and public safety applications that are able to communicate effectively with the PSAPs and with our public safety responders. So with that, I could go on and on. Oops about next generation 911, about public safety, but the importance is, is that it is our future, and I appreciate all the work and the time and effort that you yourselves are putting into it so that we can ensure that our responders do get home safe at the end of every shift. Thank you. Thank you, Gigi, and uh, next up we'll have Mark Donaski, who's going to tie all this back into the state and local governments and uh, uh, wrap good, it up. Good luck with that, right? Good luck with that. How many of you are from Minnesota, just so I know? I was telling my peers here that they missed it by about two days, didn't they? If, if they'd have been here last Friday or Saturday, you'd see Minnesota at its finest. Um, I'm going to be relatively quick today because I know that everybody's going to ask Amanda a whole bunch of first net questions, so I want to move on. But I thought it might be kind of interesting, as long as you're in Minnesota, to hear a little bit about how Minnesota has taken and is pushing these technologies forward. It's nice to hear that they're out there, that they're coming, but how do you actually get them out there into the towns and the counties and the communities? And I think Minnesota has kind of a unique process of, of how we've gone about doing that. Um, first, a little bit about who our public safety people are in Minnesota. We're made up of about 350 plus uh, police departments. We have 87 county sheriff's offices, statewide organizations, including the Minnesota State Patrol and our Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. We're blessed with um, we're blessed, well, look at that, jumping around. We're blessed with uh, uh, 750 fire departments, most of which are probably like most of your communities, volunteer, very small, coming from, from uh, small areas. Uh, we have 104 PSAPs, that's down a little bit from where it was uh, a number of years ago, but 104 PSAPs that are serving all these emergency personnel. We have county emergency management, emergency medical system, uh, and various other first responders. And keep in mind, uh, Minnesota, not like many other states that have geographical issues, we span our public safety response from the wilderness areas of our Boundary Waters canoe area up on the northern part of Minnesota 
to a large urban environment here in the metropolitan Twin Cities down to the prairies of southern Minnesota. They offer unique challenges and communications in how we go about our business. Our legislature, um, uh, some years ago back actually in the early 2000s, back in about 2003, 2004, started to realize that they were going to have to start to come off the, the VHF radio system. And for those of you that remember the VHF system, it was a good system, the legacy system worked well, but it was hard to communicate with each other. There was interoperability, interoperability challenges, and as some of those systems were starting to go down, the legislature thought that it was, it was time to move forward into the digital era. And so what they did was they passed a statute that in essence created a statewide radio board. It's our governance body that we have here in the state of Minnesota. Uh, the statewide radio board was established with the responsibility of planning and implementing a statewide digital radio system in, in the state of Minnesota. Um, it was tasked to the Commissioner of Public Safety to uh, uh, put that plan forward. And in kind of a unique twist, our Department of Transportation was tasked with building, operating, and maintaining that system because at that time, our state system, that's our, our uh, the statewide backbone system, was, was owned and operated by our Department of Transportation, so it seemed to make sense at the time. The uh, legislature mandated who the members of the, of the board were going to be, and in essence, uh, uh, as in most political situations, everybody wanted there to be some type of, of uh, voice. There had to be fairness. Obviously, we have a large metropolitan area that has a lot of people in here, and there was some concern that in greater Minnesota that a lot of their assets and a lot of the resources would come to the metro area, and the, and the greater Minnesota wouldn't be represented. So as you can see, we have a number of state agencies on here, the Commissioner of Public Safety who chairs the statewide uh, board, Commissioner of Transportation, the Chief Information Officer, Natural Resources, State Patrol, Management and Budget, which is the uh, finance arm of the state of Minnesota. And we get down to, we have the chair of the Metropolitan Council. We have two elected city officials, one from Greater Minnesota. What we refer to as Greater Minnesota is the rural area. We like to call it Greater Minnesota because they're not lesser than the Metropolitan, they're Greater Minnesota. Um, from our rural area that's out there, somebody from inside the metropolitan area. We have two elected county officials, one from Greater Minnesota, one from the metropolitan area. Two sheriffs, one from the nine county metropolitan area, which in fact is Sheriff Rich Stanek, represents the metropolitan area on our, on our board. One from Greater Minnesota. Two chiefs, police chiefs, one from the Greater Minnesota, one from Metro, two fire chiefs, two representatives from emergency uh, medical services, the chair of the regional board, and a representative from the, from the Greater Minnesota radio boards. So you can see we have a, have a real array of people that come on this governing body to talk about how we're going to develop and how we're going to roll out our new land mobile radio system. In essence, what we ended up with is, is uh, something that looks like this. This is our governing process. You see it's named the Statewide Emergency Communications Board now. About two years ago, as FirstNet started to come forward and as we started to adopt more of the next generation pieces that were out there, the legislature deemed it that the board should move from just being the statewide radio board to rather the statewide emergency communications board. And it's difficult for you to see, but as you look across the bottom here, we've expanded across. We have a 911, uh, next generation 911 committee. We have an interoperable data committee, which is in essence our first net, uh, first net uh, contact. Operations and tactical committee, which take care of policy, procedures, and standards for all the uh, communication system we put forward that um, the local entities have to, uh, I shouldn't say have to buy into, but we have, uh, we have agreement that th this is how we're going to operate our system. Uh, we have an integrated public warning system, IPOS. How many people here are aware of IPOS, have heard of IPOS before? If you haven't heard of IPOS, Google it, look it up. IPOS is going to be one of the next pieces that you're going to see coming down on emergency communications. It is the high-tech version of the old civil defense warning system across the United States. Um, interoperability committee, and you can see we have a lot of work groups under there. As I mentioned before, we have a lot of public safety entities in the state of Minnesota, and we have a lot of work groups that make sure that everybody can talk to each other and communicate with each other in various ways. And then like most committees, we have a legislative committee, a steering committee, and a finance committee that pulls this all together to make sure, make sure that it all works. In support of the Statewide Emergency Communications Board, within uh, my department, the Department of Public Safety, we have a division that's referred to as Emergency Communi Communications Networks. Uh, they are the state entity that supports the SECB and provides them the administrative support and the fiscal support and manages all the money in the process that they go through to see that this SECB can get their, get their work done. So what does it all mean? What does it all do? Well, uh, some of the stuff that we've done in this collaborative process is we have deployed one of the largest 800 trunked uh, LMR uh, land mobile radio systems in the country. Uh, and the state of Minnesota has approximately 400 towers across the state. Of that, approximately 80 of the 320 are actually part of the state backbone. 80 are local entities, such as, uh, um, Sheriff, I'm not sure, do you have your own local towers that you brought onto this as well? 
local entities that didn't get as much coverage as they wanted for in-building and stuff had the option of building their own towers out there and joining the system and participating in it. So there's about 80 towers that are out there that are locally owned and integrated into the overall system. Um, we have uh, just over 80,000 radios on our system at this time, I believe is what the, what the last number was. As part of the requirements for the system as it was built out, the board agreed that the system would have at least 95% coverage in each one of our 87 counties on mobile radio. So the system is designed to have 95% coverage mobile radio. Those are radios that you would have in a squad car in an ambulance, not necessarily a portable. And we're coming very close to achieving that. Um, the interesting thing about that is, and, and Sheriff Stanek can attest to this because he was clearly there, where the value of a system like this really shows up, and we talked a little bit about how, changing, how, how it's changed and what the need for FirstNet is. As you're probably aware, in Minneapolis, the 35 bridge collapsed several years ago. At the time, I know both Sheriff Stanek was down there and I responded down there as chief of the Minnesota State Patrol. Our 800 megahertz system operated nearly flawlessly. We had literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of first responders coming from all over the metropolitan area and even outside the metropolitan area. The 800 megahertz system stood strong. I can, I can remember standing, looking over that chasm where the bridge was though, and for 45 minutes my cell phone wouldn't work. My cell phone was down. The, the, the data system just went collapsed on it. And so the idea that we have to have a dedicated system that allow first responders to have access to that data is critical. Nevertheless, our 800 system has worked uh, very, very well. Uh, we've completed, as, as Gigi talked about, next generation. Uh, very happy that in Minnesota, through the SECB, we've completed phase one of moving and migrating onto the next generation system. All 104 of our PSAPs in the state of Minnesota are on an IP backbone, and we anticipate by the first quarter of next year we'll start uh, some of our initial movement for text to 911 and some of our PSAPs. As I mentioned, IPAWS is coming forward. The SECB has already established protocols and standards for implementing IPAWS in the state of Minnesota. And as was mentioned, Minnesota was the second state in the country that went through its initial FirstNet consultation. In fact, um, through the SECB, prior to FirstNet getting up and running a couple of years ago, the SECB had actually uh, instigated a, a uh, process in the state of Minnesota to look at deploying our own uh, broadband network. And so we were a few steps ahead of the game because we had already done some of our surveys and some of the back work on it when FirstNet came out, so we had a lot of our paperwork ready to go. Um, I don't want to linger on the, on the first net consultation process. We did have it last week. I was there all, all day long. Uh, for those, you know, the, the common saying is, was like drinking water out of a fire hose. Uh, there was a lot of, lot of information that came out, a lot of good information. There were some very good points that I think a lot of people questioned and said, aha, now I get it. Um, but I will say that there's a lot of questions still. And, and I will mention uh, as well, and I'm not taking, uh, you know, man, that was thunder, but um, I think that as they go through a few more of the states, uh, their learning processes for FirstNet as well. They understand some of the questions that have come up and I think that to tailor that. So as your states come forward with this, I think you'll find that it'll get easier and easier for the states to move, move through the process. We of course do have challenges. Uh, I would like to stand up here and say this is the greatest thing in the world, SECB. You should have a wonderful governing body like us, but like any governing body, there are challenges associated with it. One of the things we're finding clearly is this is all great stuff, but it costs lots and lots and lots of money, lots of money. And what we're finding, as I mentioned before, we have a lot of very small police departments. We have a lot of small sheriff's offices. Sheriff Stanek's office is the largest in, in, the, in the state with a lot of officers, a huge jail complex. If you go to the northern part of our state, Lake of the Woods County has a sheriff and three deputies. And so the idea that we have this wide variety of sizes and, and uh, resources available to them is a challenge for an organization or for a governing body. Um, technology advances faster than governmental processes. The technology is coming along and a lot of times the governmental process about can we do it or can't we do it and how should we do it can't keep up. In fact, we're dealing with our Attorney General's office in the state of Minnesota now trying to find out what and if we can even participate in the first net process based on current statutes and if we're going to have to change statutes in order to participate. Clearly politics and political priorities come into play. Um, what we on an SECB feel was like going forward with and what is really uh, charged for us uh, is not necessarily what the politicians think are out there, especially in terms of the high cost of technology. And lastly, but not least, for those of us who have been around for a few years, um, the pace of change can be difficult. Uh, we just had a strategic planning session for our statewide emergency communications board, very well received. Talked about Armour, they thought it was great. Talked about Next Generation, thought it was great. Thought FirstNet was great. But at the same time thought, man, this is all moving really, really fast. Can we slow down just a little bit, make sure we've got our land mobile radio anchored, let's make sure we've got our next generation up to speed, and then let's kind of sneak into that first net piece because a lot of it moves really fast for a lot of us that have been in the system for a long time. So with that, I will uh, leave it because I know that there's a lot of first net questions and other things. Thank you for attending your conference in Minnesota. I hope you have a great stay.
And yeah, thank you, Mark. Great, great wrap up. Uh, we have time, a little time for questions. Anyone who would like to ask a question, there's a microphone uh, right back there. If you could uh, go uh, use the microphone. I, I actually have a quick question. I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative. And this question is actually for Gigi. You mentioned the Xbox and the police car, which I think is fascinating, and the kind of the generational differences. Do, do you see challenges with uh, upgrading uh, PSAPs and dispatch centers to next generation technology from uh, the, the uh, I guess, training and, and, and getting uh, the, the dispatchers and the call takers to, to embrace the new technology and to learn how to, how to deal with that? Can, could you just spend a minute or so talking about that? Is this on? Yes. Um, yeah, there's actually, there is a lot of challenges. Um, I hate to date myself, but even back in the day when we went from writing everything down on a car log to getting a CAD system, we had a number of people that had worked for our office that had been there for quite some time that were too nervous. They just didn't think that, that one, the technology was going to work, or that two, they could do the technology. And so we had many of them separate from our agency itself. That is another thing that what we're seeing is that, yeah, those that are coming in, they're going to have to have a different skill set than those telecommunicators of the past. And so as administrators, we really need to look towards that. The other thing is that, and I've talked with this before, there's different levels. Yes, there's the technology that they're going to have to work with and that we're going to have to make sure that we train them and we spend the time and the effort and the money's on, but also our telecommunicators are going to be seeing things that never before have they seen. Um, yes, we've heard the voices and we've heard, you know, the screams and the cries and those types of things that I'm sure that you're familiar with, but now as we're receiving photos and videos, we're going to be seeing what those responders see on the scene, and that's a whole different level of handling the stress and just the type of work and the situations that we're dealing with with our communicators. Thank you. Question? Yes, I'm, I'm with city government and we have our own police department and we have our own telecommunications utility. And what I'm wondering is, is, since this is a little bit down the road, what can we do to prepare for, you know, making this all a reality? Um, should we make sure there's tower space? Should we put in access points on our network? What should we do to make sure that we're in a position to take full advantage of FirstNet when it is available? So I, I would say, um, you know, get to know your state's single point of contact to get in touch with, with that individual to, to participate in the consultation process. Uh, many of the SPOCs are creating their own websites or, or sending out additional information to the states. So, um, so get involved in that, that process and, and stay up to date on what's going on. Um, we are, are looking to, as I mentioned, we're working on a uh, draft RFP for a comprehensive network solution. So um, that that RFP process is going to be part of the, the state consultation process and we don't envision a state plan cannot be finalized until FirstNet has identified a partner or partners to help us build this network. Um, so again, there's we're in the really early stages. I don't know that there's anything specific right now that I would say to do, but, but get to know your, your SPOC. Um, have conversations with, with your stakeholders about how folks are currently using mobile data um, and, and how maybe they see it in the future so people are starting to sort of think outside the box and, and how when FirstNet is here, how they might, might use it. Can I just, sure. just from a standpoint of a representative of a, of a, of a local agency, you need to pay attention to what's going on. Uh, you need to keep up. You need to visit the FirstNet website and read what's on there and, and, and follow the blog and, 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 and keep up with what's going on with your state as well. But uh, th there are a lot, of, a lot of things happening and uh, there will be a lot of things happening down the road. And so it's really important just to, to assign someone to kind of pay attention to all of this. Uh, again, you can also uh, participate in NOTOA's uh, Public Safety Committee. And, and we'll be providing regular updates uh, through that committee as well. But it's something that, uh, that you, 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 know, you really need to get engaged with and pay attention to uh, as we move forward. This is a follow-up to Larry's question, and I'm with King County, Washington, and we're in the process of getting ready to purchase a huge 
a new radio system, a replacement for radios. And my question to you would be, so when we get all this new equipment in place, will this equipment be compatible with the FirstNet system, or will we have to then go out and get new equipment? Because equipment is really your big expense in this whole thing, and we've already said that. So I'd just like to get some feedback on that from you. So um, you're talking about procuring a new land mobile radio system? Correct. Yeah. So, so as I mentioned in that, that slide where I talked about the vision, exactly. um, you know, right, right now we don't want folks to, to stop making those investments. That, that's going to be needed for some time. Um, you know, as the, the network evolves and we get it stood up, I and mean, we'll be looking at how we can integrate land mobile radio with, with the FirstNet network, but, um, you know, many of those things are, still haven't been determined yet. So, thank you. Yeah. Amanda and Gigi, I'm Jonathan Kramer. I am a, a radio tech uh, certified by APCO. I'm an attorney that writes ordinances. And a heck of a lot of ordinances are, go, are just on the verge of uh, being rewritten because of well, these guys right here. So, it seems to me that we could certainly use help in terms of model draft language. Uh, so that we don't inadvertently lock out first, uh, FirstNet as an easily approvable project. Uh, but we need more technical details so that we can make sure that we don't open the gates too far. Is that information come out? Is it, is it out now? Is it coming out? I know there was draft, let, draft uh, ordinance uh, models, things like that, that will help facilitate FirstNet. So, so uh the, the answer, I think, is that it, it's a little too early. Uh, Amanda mentioned the RFI that's just been released. Uh, that will be followed by an RFP, and, and there will be a lot of information that will be coming out on the, the technical specs of the network. Uh, but right now, those just aren't available. Okay. Uh, um, the, I, 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 I think it's a great idea to figure out a way to collaborate so that, so that um, as you're drafting the model ordinance, you're able to, to communicate with FirstNet. And, and so maybe I'll chat with Amanda, or we could chat and figure out a way to just to keep kind of some uh, lines of communication open as you're going through the process. All right, seems important. Uh, and uh, for Gigi, I uh, hope you'll come out with a certification for Radio Text for, for uh, FirstNet. I need another certification. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Jody Miller. I'm from here in the Twin Cities of Minnesota. And I'm not sure how to articulate my question. But many of us have a franchise provided fiber ring or fiber network in our uh, multi city cable commission groups that is providing the public safety um, exclusive separate fiber network for the public safety traffic. And it's through our franchises with our cable operators. And many of those are up for renewal now. And in some cases, um, some communities will be going to a different model in the future. So I, I believe we need to be aware of something here and that we need to be in touch and understanding what that means. That's my form of a question, I guess. Okay. Um, so, so I think one, one part I didn't um, spend much time or maybe I didn't even mention is the legislation does um, encourage or does require FirstNet to leverage existing commercial infrastructure as well as um, where economically desirable um, state, local, tribal, federal infrastructure. Um, there's a number of questions related to that topic about timing of when, when we might look to do that um, in the acquisition process and the deployment process, how we might go about doing that, what kinds of agreements we would have to enter into, um, how you know, we might charge fees for that or, or you know, pay for that. So there's a number of questions in the RFI related to this topic that um, are going to help us sort of figure this out in, in terms of timing. But, but know that the act does require us. We know the $7 billion is not going to be enough to develop a nationwide network. So we're going to have to leverage um, existing commercial and, and government infrastructure. Does that help? Thank you. OK. okay well, we have one time for one more quick question. I'm not sure if it was covered, but, but I'm wondering 
when when is first net going to become a reality when when will it be done so i don't have an exact answer the the cost and the time frame are the common questions that we pretty much get at every outreach event we do and unfortunately we don't have answers to either of those questions but um, we're getting closer every day and, and some of this information that we're, we're putting out now to get closer to our acquisition process um, should should help shed some light there um, our, our big milestone is to get a draft request for proposal out by um, the first quarter of calendar year 2015 so by March of next year um, and then depending on the feedback we get through this RFI process now, the feedback we get on the draft RFP, you know, following the release of that, um, sometime next year we, we hope to put out the final RFP. Um, and then um, once we get responses back to that and, you know, award a, a partner or partners, we'll have to continue to work through the state consultation process and develop those, those state plans. So, it's, it's still going to be some time. I mean, we have a lot of work to do on the acquisition front, a lot of consultation and, and outreach activities. But um, it's not going to be next year, I can tell you that for sure, in terms of actually having a network, um, if that helps. All right, let's have another round of applause for our great panel. Thank you so much. Um, I think uh, lunch is next. Uh, I forgot to mention I have actually a prototype of a public safety smartphone that is uh, been uh, basically uh, made by a manufacturer in the, in the San Francisco Bay Area. It's hardened for public safety, which means you, apparently you can throw it on the ground. It won't break. Uh, it has an extra bright screen for outdoor use. You can use it with gloves, uh, a number of things, and it actually is uh, Ad adaptable to uh, the new FirstNet spectrum. So this is just a model of some of the some of the handheld phones that you might be seeing when you're uh, w when FirstNet rolls out. I'll be around the conference. Uh, if you want to take a look, I'll have it in my pocket. And I can show it to you. And thank you all. Um, appreciate it. Well, did you